We've already learned that the criterion for spontaneity is an increase in the entropy of the universe. However, we can think of examples that seem to contradict this. For example, when water freezes at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, the entropy of the water decreases. Yet somehow, that process is spontaneous. In other words, at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, the water will spontaneously freeze. So, how does that happen? To answer this question, we can think about the second law of thermodynamics. That says that for any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe must increase. So even though the entropy of the water decreased during the freezing process, the entropy of the universe must have somehow increased. We can make sense of this by dividing the universe into two parts. The first part we'll call the system, and in this example, that would be the sample of water that is freezing. The rest of the universe, the universe that is not part of the system, is going to be called the surroundings. So, in other words, if the entropy for the system is decreasing, that means that there must be an increase in the entropy of the surroundings. Furthermore, for the entropy of the universe to be positive or increase, that means the entropy change of the surroundings must be positive and greater in magnitude than the decrease in the entropy of the system. But how does the surroundings have an increase in entropy? Because that process is exothermic, it gives off heat to the surroundings. Since we think of entropy as a dispersal or randomization of energy, the release of heat by the system disperses that energy into the surroundings, thus increasing the entropy of the surroundings. In other words, an exothermic process increases the entropy of the surroundings, but an endothermic process decreases the entropy of the surroundings. We've already seen that the freezing of water at temperatures below zero degrees increases the entropy of the surroundings by dispersing heat into the surroundings. Yet we know that the freezing of water is not spontaneous at all temperatures. The freezing of water becomes non-spontaneous at temperatures above zero degrees Celsius. This is because the magnitude of the increase in the entropy of the surroundings due to the dispersal of energy into the surroundings is dependent on temperature. In other words, the greater the temperature, the smaller the increase in entropy for a given amount of energy dispersed into the surroundings. In other words, the higher the temperature, the smaller the impact of the energy dispersed into the surroundings. We've already seen that the enthalpy change of the system is related to the entropy change of the surroundings. In general, the magnitude of the change in entropy of the surroundings is proportional to the magnitude of the heat released by the system. We can quantify this relationship by saying that the change in the entropy of the surroundings is equal to the opposite of the heat lost by the system divided by the temperature. In this case, the heat, or Q, is going to be in units of joules, and the temperature, or capital letter T, is going to be in units of Kelvin. We've also seen that if we have a system under constant pressure, then the Q, or the heat of the system, is equal to the enthalpy change of the system. Therefore, we can also write the relationship that the change in the entropy of the surroundings is equal to the opposite of the change of the enthalpy of the system divided by the temperature in Kelvin. In this example, we're looking at the combustion of propane gas. In this reaction, we see that one mole of propane gas, C3H8, reacts with five moles of oxygen gas to produce three moles of carbon dioxide gas and four moles of water gas. This particular reaction has an enthalpy change of negative 2044 kilojoules. We're asked to calculate the entropy change for the surroundings for this reaction at 298 Kelvin, and then we're asked to determine the sign of the entropy change for the system, and then based on those two entropy values, we're asked to determine the sign of the entropy change for the universe. 
Once we know the sign of the entropy change for the universe, this will help us decide if this reaction will be spontaneous at this temperature. We begin this problem by recognizing that the entropy change for the surroundings is given by the equation delta S surroundings equals negative delta H system or reaction divided by temperature. Once we plug in those values, we find that the entropy change for the surroundings is 6.86 times 10 to the third joules per Kelvin, and that's a positive value. Now that we know the entropy change for the surroundings has a positive value, we can look at the entropy change for the system. We can do this by comparing the change in the moles of gas from the reactant side to the product side. In this case, we see that we have one mole of propane and five moles of oxygen for a total of six moles of gas on the reactant side. On the product side, we see that we have three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water in the gas phase for a total of seven moles of gas on the product side. This means that we are going from six moles of gas on the reactant side to seven moles of gas on the product side, so there's an overall increase in the moles of gas, and that means that we have a positive entropy change for the system or for the reaction. Now that we know the sign of the entropy change for the surroundings, and we know the sign of the entropy change for the system, we can add those together to determine the sign of the entropy change for the universe, which is the third thing we're asked to do. Since we're adding together the signs of the entropy change for the surroundings and the entropy change for the system, that means that the entropy change for the universe, in this case, at this temperature, will also be positive. Finally, since we're asked to predict whether this reaction will be spontaneous at this temperature, we know that if the entropy change of the universe is positive, then the reaction will be spontaneous. So the combustion of propane at 298K is going to be a spontaneous reaction. In your General Chemistry 1 class, you learned how to calculate the standard enthalpy change for a reaction, and you learned that the standard enthalpy change for a reaction is based on the standard enthalpies for the reactants and the products. We can use a similar equation to find the standard entropy change for a reaction. In this case, the standard entropy change for a reaction is based on the sum of the standard molar entropies for the products multiplied by their coefficients and then we subtract from that the standard molar entropies for the reactants multiplied by their coefficients. Values for the standard molar entropies for different compounds or elements can be found in either Table 17.2 in this chapter or in Appendix 2 of the textbook. There are some trends that we notice for standard molar entropies. First of all, for a particular compound, we see that the standard molar entropy for the gas is going to be larger than the standard molar entropy for the liquid, and the standard molar entropy for the liquid will be larger than the standard molar entropy for the solid. We also see that for two similar compounds, the standard molar entropy increases as the molar mass increases, assuming the number of atoms are constants. We also see that the standard molar entropy increases as molecular complexity increases. The reason this is the case is that as molecules become more complex, they have more rotational and vibrational modes in addition to the translational modes that we already discussed earlier. Finally, we see that if we have, for example, a solid versus an aqueous phase for a compound, then the aqueous phase will have a greater standard molar entropy than the solid phase will. In this problem, we're asked to use standard molar entropy values from the appendix of the textbook to find the standard entropy change for the given reaction. In this reaction, 
we have 4 moles of ammonia gas reacting with 5 moles of oxygen gas to produce 4 moles of nitrogen monoxide gas and 6 moles of water in the gas phase. We begin this process by looking up the standard molar entropies for each of these compounds in the appendix. When we do this, we have to pay attention to the physical states that are given in the problem. In this case, all of these compounds are in the gas phase. For ammonia gas, we find that the standard molar entropy is 192.8 joules per mole kelvin. For oxygen gas, it has a value of 205.2. Nitrogen monoxide has a standard molar entropy of 210.8. And water in the gas phase has a standard molar entropy of 188.8. Now, to calculate the standard entropy change for the reaction, we use the equation that was given in the previous slide. In other words, we take the sum of the moles of the products multiplied by the standard molar entropies for each of the products, and then we subtract from that the sum of the coefficients of the reactants multiplied by the standard molar entropies for the reactants. When we plug these values in, we find that the sum of the standard molar entropies for the products is 1,976.0 joules per kelvin, and the sum of the standard molar entropies for the reactants multiplied by their coefficients is 1,797.2 joules per kelvin. When we subtract those values, we find that the change in the standard molar entropy for the reaction is 178.8 joules per kelvin. In this video, we learned that the second law of thermodynamics says that in order for a process to be spontaneous, the entropy change for the universe has to be positive or greater than zero. We also learned that to define the entropy change for the universe, we could find the entropy change for the system plus the entropy change for the surroundings. We also learned how to calculate the entropy change for the surroundings based on either the heat or the enthalpy change for the system divided by the temperature in Kelvin. After we did that, we learned that we can also calculate the entropy change for a reaction or system by taking the coefficients of the products multiplied by the standard molar entropy of the products and subtracting from that the coefficients of the reactants multiplied by the standard molar entropies for the reactants. We also learned some trends in standard molar entropies. So now we should be able to look at a couple compounds and predict which of those compounds will have the greater standard molar entropy.